Listen, many Star Trek battles are among the most amazing things in sci-fi, and it is far from the special effects alone that really make the best Star Trek battles. The best Star Trek battles have just the right combination of tension building, suspense, pacing, and character emotion. The worst Star Trek battles are the ones that are just a routine fire hose of special effects for their own sake, without any kind of tactics or strategy, or kind of a battle of wits, you see. Let's take a look at some rules for good Star Trek battles. We're going to use some real-world naval tactics for reference, and then also look at some game theory. The reason I'm doing it this way is that over the years Star Trek battles are portrayed every which way on the screen, and the reality is that unless the writer of the episode is some kind of technical Trekkie nerd, or has one as a consultant, the writing of their Star Trek battle will probably be without substance and flaccid. I highly recommend that anyone who wants to write a Star Trek battle is that they study up on some naval warfare tactics or they play some of the best Star Trek combat games or even naval warfare games or both. But which naval warfare era is best and which Star Trek games do this the best? Well, there are a few games both in computer game format and tabletop format. I won't be able to go over all of them in this video, but there's a particular point I need to make at least about a couple of them. Also, let's talk about how naval warfare tactics are always a pretty good fallback when it comes to creating a Star Trek battle, or really any kind of space battle. Now, I'll be showing some Star Trek games footage and perhaps some of my own CG animations here, but interspersed throughout this video, I'm going to be showing a bit of World of Warships footage to make a one-to-one -one comparison. If you really want to get a feel for this one-to-one -one comparison, I recommend you play World of Warships, which covers World War I era battleships all the way into post-World War II. This is going to be a shortish plug because I've already got a lot of World of Warships content throughout this video. I'm still promoting them as a sponsor. If you use my link in the description, this is a win-win for everybody. It will help me out a lot and you'll be able to play the game for free with some extra bonuses. I'm not the greatest salesman really, I don't like taking on sponsors or products that I don't use and enjoy myself, but I do really like World of Warships, and it's in everyone's best interest to at least get the gist of naval warfare and use that knowledge to cultivate an understanding of sci-fi space battles. And no, World of Warships is not pay to win. So click that link in the description. In fact, we'll start right away with the naval warfare aspect. If you know nothing about Star Trek Starship Combat, try to use some naval warfare as a reference. But what kind of naval warfare and in what era? The Age of Sail? World War I? World War II? Submarine warfare? Modern naval warfare? Or a combination of all of the above? Well, consider this. The first real battle in Star Trek took place in the original series episode, Balance of Terror, and is probably still up there in the top three Star Trek battles of all time. I made an entire 15 minute video breakdown about this. But why was it that great? I mean, the special effects at the time were nowhere near what they are today, and yet that battle is still fondly remembered. One reason is that it's directly inspired by the movie The Enemy Below, where a US World War II destroyer, which is our Enterprise analog, fights a German U-boat, which is our Romulan bird of prey analog. It worked simply because of the cloaking device, which is the metaphor for a submerged submarine being very difficult, albeit not impossible, to detect. And it has one hell of a weapon, torpedoes, in the case of the Romulans, a deadly plasma torpedo. All it had to do is hit you once, and then it may cripple or destroy your ship. So the submarine battle trope is certainly one way you can go. It was sort of done again in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan where it was more like both ships were in submarines and could barely detect each other inside a gaseous nebula, which was probably some kind of stellar nursery. However, before you latch onto this as your go-to inspiration, I'd like to note that it is certainly getting to a point where this naval submarine analog is becoming overdone, as it was blatantly done once again in Star Trek Strange New Worlds with the Gorn battle inside the atmosphere of a gas giant. If that battle was something you'd never seen before, you would think it was pretty awesome, and and I guess it does kind of have its own merits, but it's a bit overdone now. But submarine battles are endlessly suspenseful. You never know when or where you're going to detect the enemy, and vice versa. So the tension has time to build. If you have two starships in a nebula or some other soupy space environment, or with cloaking devices, 
This can be interesting in various ways, but the reality is that space is wide open and most objects with any kind of heat signature are very easy to detect. So then in those cases where sneaking around is not a thing, what real world analogs can we use? Could it be something like modern surface combat naval warfare, say a destroyer versus another destroyer or cruiser? I'll leave fighters out for now. Let's backtrack a bit and let us point out that energy weapons, phasers, disruptors, etc. are an analog for naval guns. They are a more accurate and faster firing alternative to photon torpedoes, plasma torpedoes, and the like. So torpedoes are a direct one-to-one -one comparison for naval torpedoes. But what about longer range anti-ship missiles? Because in modern naval warfare, it's all about the missile barrage. Guns are no longer a primary weapon of choice like they were in the previous two world wars, but are now more of a secondary weapon. In the case of something like the Sea Whiz, they're mostly used to shoot down these anti-ship missiles, making it a defensive weapon, along with smaller interceptor missiles like the Sea Sparrow. However, Star Trek does not quite have a direct equivalent to this these days. Torpedoes are not a direct comparison to missiles, as they, for some reason, are not normally easy to shoot down. Perhaps they have some kind of technology to prevent this in the case of a photon torpedo. Just like you wouldn't normally be able to target and shoot down an underwater torpedo with your naval warship guns. However, I will note that the Enterprise did destroy a Ferengi missile with phasers in the TNG episode, The Price. So perhaps the ability to shoot a missile, or perhaps even a torpedo, depends on the type of torpedo. It is possible that many Star Trek torpedoes are difficult to get a weapons lock on, whereas slower moving ones are a little easier to destroy with phasers. The other issue with modern naval warfare is that these battles occur at far beyond visual range, even far beyond the visual horizon in some cases. And this is where the original series in many ways is more like modern naval warfare. In the battle with the Gorn in the original episode Arena, the entire space battle takes place beyond visual range, and although this is not a particularly cinematic or visually interesting battle, there is a precedent for this. But I have to say that this is a far more realistic situation, especially with phasers that have ranges of hundreds of thousands of kilometers. This does not quite match up with most Star Trek battles you see on screen. I will note, however, that beyond visual range battles still can make for an interesting battle scene. You simply fire with one ship, cut to the target ship, which is nowhere inside of the firing ship, and show the weapon impacts thusly. So this is one way it can be done if you want to get into more realism. Now let's take it back a notch to World War II. Are World War II battles a good direct inspiration for Star Trek battles? Well, they can be a little bit, especially in the case of submarine warfare. However, World War II naval battles would eventually become known as being dominated by planes, fighters, bombers, etc., and massive carriers. There are two other sci-fi franchises that will always portray this better than Star Trek, and this is Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica. Those franchises got to space fighter combat long before Star Trek and have staked a claim there. Now I'm not saying that fighters don't have an occasional role in Star Trek, if you could even call them fighters, but the thing is that Star Trek's focus was always on the big ships and the crew within them, not fighter pilots. I suspect they tried to make Star Trek more like Star Wars in the final episodes of Star Trek Discovery, but to me this kind of looks like a silly fire hose of special effects rather than a tactical battle of wits. Nobody ever says, you remember that Star Trek battle with swarms of shuttles and fighters? That was great. No, they say, do you remember how Kirk stalled Khan while Spock hacked into the Reliant shields and lowered them? Or do you remember how the Enterprise narrowly avoided total destruction by pretty much outrunning the Romulan plasma torpedo? Or how Data has to cycle phaser frequencies to damage the Borg ship so the Enterprise could escape from it? Anyway, most of World War II naval tactics, except for a few gun battles and submarine battles, are not the best inspiration for Star Trek. Star Wars seems to have this down pat. But to narrow down our references, let's go back even further to the Age of Sail. Visually for Star Trek, copying a brawling gun battle between two majestic tall ships kind of works. It worked for the first attack on the Enterprise by Khan in Star Trek II. In a real battle in the Age of Sail, Cannonballs smash through the hull and injure or kill crew, 
They disable rigging, cause fires, wreak havoc, take out vital systems, all that. It makes for a lot of suspense and drama. And don't get me wrong, there are real tactics for combat in the Age of Sail, such as who has the weather vane. The ship that is upwind of the enemy has all the maneuverability advantages and can bring the guns to bear more effectively. The firing of these old guns had to be timed just right to have maximum impact. Later I'll show you exactly how this might be duplicated in Star Trek as well. However, it is kind of difficult to translate something like the wind in Star Trek, where ships are able to maneuver on their own power. The weather vane is not a factor here. Also, there were no self-propelled torpedoes in the Age of Sail. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. Let's go to an era where the ships have turrets, which can freely move and aim themselves, and also when torpedoes were used often. But there wasn't much of a role for aircraft other than perhaps the occasional scout. And that would be World War I and perhaps some of what is known as the pre-Dreadnought era of the late 19th century. World War I mostly works great though. Guns can still be a decent analog for phasers, torpedoes, and other direct fire energy weapons. Torpedoes were also in frequent use. Anything from torpedo boats, destroyers, up to battleships could have them, and they have very devastating effects when they would hit. However, no torpedoes were guided like they are in modern warfare. This is an open question for Star Trek. Do torpedoes, namely photon and quantum torpedoes, home in on their target? I think they probably do, at least some of them do to a limited degree. Even back as far as World War I, torpedoes were not exactly direct fire weapons. You would fire them out of the tube of, say, a submarine, and then they would maneuver or sort of right themselves onto a preset direction. I can see some torpedoes in Star Trek making this maneuver. Now one thing about missile weapons and torpedoes in space, talking real world physics here, is that because of inertia, once they're launched at a particular velocity, it will tend to keep going in that direction without some very strong self-propelled maneuvering. You cannot have a particularly fast homing torpedo, or it may miss, but a slow one wouldn't catch a ship. They could, however, move slowly to follow the target until they reach a range where they can accelerate and hit, but perhaps these are all settings that have to be considered by the tactical officer who fires the torpedoes. I really feel that most torpedoes in Star Trek could be a semi-homing, but can certainly miss and they do miss often. Another thing we didn't really get to see until about the TNG era is the glorious photon torpedo spread. However, torpedo spreads were definitely a thing in the real world in both world wars to maximize the chance of hitting. Now guns, you see the main guns on battleships and dreadnoughts back in World War I could sometimes take like a minute to reload and fire. But some of you nerds will argue that Star Trek weapons like phasers are more of a continuous fire weapon. Okay, now let's stop and consider. If you want the suspense of what seems like a very strategically timed phaser blast, a slower firing weapon or slower reloading weapon is the way to go. I know this because there is a really cool Star Trek game that simulates this and I will explain how that can work in a minute. But strictly for naval warfare inspiration, this is my conclusion. For your generic Star Trek battle, World War I surface engagements are pretty good to go to for inspiration there. For battles in a nebula or cloak ships, submarine warfare, even in the modern era, works pretty well, as long as you don't overdo it. And then if Star Trek ships should find themselves fighting up close in visual range, consider what naval battles in the Age of Sail were like. Now, this is where I will get into some game theory, some serious game theory about Star Trek space battles. First, we must talk about the tabletop game called Starfleet Battles by Task Force Games created back in 1979. But wait, before we talk about that, we have to talk about another pen and paper game called Jutland created in 1967. That game was a World War I naval simulator based on the ships in the Battle of Jutland. Okay, see where I'm going? In 1975, Stephen V. Cole and his friend were playing Jutland when the Star Trek rerun came on. Within a couple of days, he had created the stats for a Starfleet Constitution class cruiser and a Klingon D7 cruiser that would fight it out. Voila, Starfleet Battles was born, directly inspired by World War I naval warfare. Now because of pesky copyright issues, they were limited to the Star Trek content and the era before the movies, so 
they kind of created their own separate Star Trek universe within the game. However, in 1999, Interplay Entertainment created a computer game based almost entirely on Starfleet battles, and they were even allowed to use the movie-era models. It truly is a naval warfare Star Trek game in space. The reason I really enjoyed it was because you could use timing, tactics, and maneuvers that really mattered. I'll give you an example here. Each ship has six shield arcs, shaped like a hexagon around the ship. And if one in particular shield on the enemy ship is weak, well, you want to try to get through that shield so you can actually do damage to the enemy ship's hull. This is where the timing I talked about earlier really comes into play. You really want to time your shots to hit the enemy ship where they are the most vulnerable. I talked about the fire rate of phasers earlier and why continuously firing them at a very high reload speed is not as exciting. Instead, there is this thing called a phaser capacitor in every ship. The more power you have allocated to the phaser capacitor, the more quickly those phasers would charge. So you time and fire your weapon strategically. Reposition, wait, and fire again when the best opportunity presents itself. This is suspenseful. It builds tension until you can do something and then releases it with a barrage of phaser or disruptor fire. This is also similar in World of Warships, but instead of shields, it's all about the armor. Some ships have thick armor only on the armor belt that protects the citadel from critical hits, and some ships have a hilariously exposed citadel where an armor penetrating shell could get through and cause massive damage to vital systems. If a shell hits a heavily armored ship at an odd angle, it is likely to just bounce off and cause no real damage. However, if you can hit straight on, you're going to cause more damage to that ship, the degree of which depends on the armor thickness, the velocity of the shell, the size of the shell, and the type of shell that hits. And I have to say that sometimes Star Trek shields really act more like battleship armor than a straight barrier that must be bashed down. Often you will see, even with the shields up, a starship will take damage from a direct hit. This is kind of like a bleed through effect. This is also what happens when an armored naval warship takes a direct hit. It may keep out the majority of the damage, but you're going to have vibration effects all throughout the ship. Now before I wrap this up, I want to touch on Star Trek Online and why, at least for Starship Combat PvP, it isn't half the game that Starfleet Battles was, and here is why. Its mechanics are based on roleplay rules, not tactical combat rules. The problem with a lot of modern roleplay games is the basic strategy that works in most cases is to activate all the buffs and then attack. And for Star Trek Online, the cloaky ship that could do this the fastest would always win. So yeah, if you want to understand the very basics of Starship Combat, Star Trek Online is kind of a fun introduction, but not the end-all and be-all. I've heard great things about the old Star Trek Bridge Commander game. Unfortunately, I've not played it yet, but I certainly can see where the in-person bridge point of view can be very exciting. So those of you familiar with Bridge Commander, which I will eventually play, please comment and let me know what your thoughts are. Well, that about wraps it up here. Don't forget my World of Warships offer. The link is in the description below, as well as the first pinned comment there. You won't get the full benefit unless you use this link, but give it a go. Have fun. It's free. I enjoy it. You'll enjoy it too. All right, also, also, I am pretty much relaunching my Patreon page. This is long overdue. I apologize for current patrons that I haven't put much up there, but... Um, $5 a month patrons can get 45% off CG Trader purchases, as well as access to several of my 3D models that I have uh, zipped up here on Patreon. $8 a month patrons can get access to some of the more higher quality and popular models and 99% off of CG Trader, so more or less free, I guess. So head on over to patreon.com slash resurrected. For the $1 a month patrons, I'm still planning on doing some higher quality renders that you could perhaps use as a wallpaper or something for your desktop. Also, my CG Trader account is linked in the description or the first comments below. Feel free to check that out as well. I've finally got what I think is a passable 3D printable model available in the Romulan Stormbird. So be sure to comment and tell me what you think about naval warfare as it applies to Star Trek. Until next time, space friends.